ABC TV 18 special as we decode the budget fine print. Uh, Finance Minister Piyush Goel has presented the interim budget. wasn't quite interim because it made tall promises for the future, not just for the next five years, but for the next ten years as well, as he articulated what the government will do if it was voted back to power. But to discuss uh, the announcements <coughs> made and the schemes presented in the budget, joining us is uh, the team from FIKI, Sandeep Samani, the president of FIKI. Thanks very much Hi. for joining us. Oh, Mikey yeah. Modi, the past president of FIKI. Pranav Saitha, the head of the tax committee at FIKI. Subrakanta Panda of the Orissa chapter. And of course, Sangeeta Reddy joins us from Hyderabad. Uh, gentlemen and Sangeeta, thanks very much for joining us here. Sandeep Samani, let me start by asking you, batted pretty much in every direction. The question then is, in trying to please everyone, have they done enough for someone? I think this budget is a statement of intent, mm. frankly. It, it shows directionality. And I think uh, he's tried to deal with the concerns where he felt it was most justified. So I think he's uh, trying to do a little with uh, agrarian distress by this direct uh, transfer scheme, 6,000 rupees per uh, you know, poor and marginal farmer. Mm. He's tried to get relief to the salaried and the low income, uh, 5 lakh rupee income people. Mm. So I think he's tried to do what will probably get him also some votes. votes. Yes. Yeah. Has it changed the mood enough? Uh, there have been concerns as far as growth, uh, with the slowdown as far as the economy is concerned. The hope is that this will spur consumption. That, of course, has continued to be the driver of the economy. Uh, if you look at capital expenditure, that has been a disappointment, growing at about 4 to 5 percent. So, to your mind, uh, does this have enough to provide a fillip to the economy? I think it has enough as far as government can do. But government can do only that much. Hmm. So you need fiscal policy, you need monetary policy. Mm. So bulk of the thing will have to be done by the monetary policy. <laughs> so the point is, if the government thinking is the same huh. and this same government comes back, we hope that the Reserve Bank of India will follow in the same line. Mm. You know more than us mm. that real interest rate in India are highest in the world. Mm. And no country in the world has progressed with less investment mm. as you mentioned. Mm. So investment cannot grow if your real interest rate is 10%. Mm. So, I so think you're seeking a cut from the RBI. The MPC will meet next week. Are you that's hopeful? True. I'm hopeful and that is the only way to create jobs. Otherwise, we'll keep crying on jobs. But that's a 25 basis point or even if it's a 50 basis point cut. It should cut, be 100 basis point. That you can keep asking for. It's not going to happen, sir. Let's be very clear about that. That's but what is a 25 basis point 25 cut going to mean? 25 basis point has no value. So then... It should be at least 50 basis point plus reduce in CRR, money is available in the market, then only interest will go down. But the RBI says liquidity is not a problem. RBI says because they, nobody shoe is pinching to them, shoe is pinching to us. Mm. So we know liquidity is in crisis. If you want to go to the bond market and raise money, if RBI, government of India's bond fetch 7.5% mm. and they say no liquidity is crisis, mm. liquidity is tight. Pranav Saita, I'll, I'll put that question to you. One, of course, is the assumption that, uh, uh, that the MPC ought to now move as far as rates are concerned. But given the fact that we've seen a slippage on fiscal deficit, albeit it was expected, 3.4% uh, for FY19 and 3.4% for FY20, does this give the RBI space now to act on interest rates, you think? Yes, so this is, this is really a, a moot point. And, and the way I would look at it is, yes, here is the RBI, which is continuously projecting inflation at a certain rate. And every time it seems to go wrong on its projection and mm. the actual inflation rate that turns up is much less than mm. the expected rate as predicted by RBI itself. Here we are in the second half of this year, growth has slipped from 7.4% in the first half to maybe an expected 6.8%. It might be revised upwards later, we don't, of course. We don't <laughs> we know, don't know. Right, given, right given now, what we're seeing happen with data. So we have an inflation number of 2.19% yeah. in December. Yeah. We have growth slipping from 74 to 6.8%. There is a slight slippage in the fiscal deficit, there is no doubt about it. Is the need of the hour today giving a fillip to the growth and mm. job creation? Mm. Definitely there are pros and cons to everything and certainly a drop in the interest rate will have its share of cons. Mm. Mm. But is, is it more the demand today, the need of the hour today to drop the interest rates yeah. and give a fillip to growth, chance to job creation mm. more than worrying about inflation given where 2.19% mm. it is, given where no, continuous... Back to my point on, sure. is the case being overstated? Suddenly are we going to start to create jobs? Suddenly are we going to grow at 8.5%? Eight, eight yes. Even if we do see 
assuming we see a 50 basis point cut. I mean, I, I'm saying, but, you know, industry should be happy if it gets 25 basis points, given the past commentary that's coming from the <laughs> RBI. But even if it were to be 50 basis points, are you really going to see such a sharp swing as far as growth is concerned? No, but, but when we see, when we look at our clients, what we see is liquidity tightening is a very real issue hmm. today, especially after ILFS, especially after the NBFs. So that's very real, let's hmm. face it. Hmm. And it's not that it's but going to have an immediate result. But how much of that is an issue that the RBI can deal with that by way of an interest rate cut or even CRR, assuming that that demand were to come into, yeah. uh, come into effect? Yeah. Because, I mean, let's look at what's happening with the corporate sector, for instance. Sure. Uh, there, there is the asset liability mismatch. There are corporate governance issues that are showing up as far as NBFCs sure. are concerned, sure. one after the other. So, you know, I mean, w is, it, is it not then prudent for the RBI to wait and watch? It, it's like this, we have to make an effort. I'm not saying that a reduction of 25 basis points or 50 basis points is going to immediately yield results. There's a lag. We, know, we all know there's a lag of, of maybe a few months or even a year. But the point is that we have to take steps. Mm. We have to make an effort in the right direction. Okay. And that's where I feel that a uh, reduction in the rate from the RBI would be a welcome step at this point of time. <clears throat> it will have its share of cons. Mm. It has its share of risks. But on balance, that's the right thing, I would feel. Okay. Uh, at this stage of the economy. Be before I get the other panelists in, uh, very quickly on yes. what has been announced as far as the salaried class is concerned. The sure. Economic Affairs Secretary clarifying <coughs> to me that these changes are applicable from the 1st of April. Uh, secondly, there is no change in the slab or the limit. Uh, it's That's only right. the rebate that has changed. Right. So how significant uh, is this really going to be? And B, even on the basis of standard deduction and all the other announcements that have come in, from a consumptive uh, capacity perspective, how much will do you think this so, so I would feel it impacts a large taxpayer base and the impact straight away is a 10,000 rupee tax saving per individual mm. which today a rate rebate was not available probably he says the rebate will be up to 12,500 yeah. till today it is 2,500 that's right so clearly there's a 10,000 to 12,500 rebate that a person gets and that's that's not an insignificant number given that it impacts that particular category of population which really needs mm. that money in its hands and it can spur consumption. Mm. An extra 10,000 rupees to a millionaire may not make a big difference to his consumption pattern. Yeah. But an extra 10,000 in the pocket every year for a common man certainly makes a difference. Mm. Also, it sends the right signal, the right message. I think incremental changes in the slab rate of 25,000 increase or 50,000 increase we have seen a lot. Yeah. This is the first time there's a quantum jump and mm. a recognition that yes, given inflation, the threshold rate should be. Mm. So I think one must commend a step sure. to the extent it's welcome. Of course, more could have been done and so but perhaps, I still think that under the circumstances, be taken it's, not a, no. it's not a very tiny, trivial increase, it's a Fair decent point. increase. Fair point. Uh, Shubhakanta, let me ask you about the farm package that has been announced by the government and uh, perhaps some lessons being taken from the states that, uh, that you look after, which is Orissa. Uh, some parts of Kalia, uh, the scheme that the Orissa government has announced, are uh, part of this because uh, they're looking at uh, uh, providing about 6,000 rupees a year through the direct benefit transfer route into bank accounts in installments starting retrospectively from December, the first installment of about 2,000 rupees. <laughs> when that will happen, again, the Economic Affairs Secretary says it will happen soon, but they have to work with states to identify the beneficiaries. Uh, how meaningful is this likely to be? Well, uh, you know, as was uh, pointed out right at the beginning, I, I think, uh, you know, there is a recognition of the fact that there is an element of agrarian distress which mm. needs to be addressed. And, um, Finally, after, after denying it all, all, uh, all this while. Well, I mean, you know, whether you look at it from the point of view of denying it and finally accepting it or saying that, look, you know, a beginning has to be made at some point in mm. time and, and, you know, better now than, than never. And uh, so from that point of view to say, to, to make this move and, and, you know, rather than link it to subsidies which may end up being wasteful or, or spur the wrong kind of mm. um, uh, behavior, uh, uh, if I can put it that way, uh, it's, uh, you know, a, play, a simple direct benefit transfer which, yeah. which goes into the bank account of, of the identified farmer, right. I think is a good way to get this going. Mm. And just like, uh, you know, the, the, the increase in the tax uh, exemption limits will, will, put hands, uh, will put money in the hands of the, of mm. the urban middle class, mm. this is something which also uh, will put money in the hands of the, of the rural sector. And mm. that, you know, whether it, it uh, uh, I mean, addresses agrarian distress or ends up being discretionary spending, yeah. net, net, it is good for the economy. Well, you know, let's do the math. Uh, 
uh, because uh, it works out to about 500 rupees a month. Now, most people that we've spoken to, well, you know, it's a, it's a positive signal, but does it really alleviate the pain? Does it actually change uh, the, the plight of the farmer today? Uh, it doesn't, it's not even uh, the daily hiring for a tractor, for instance, is 500 rupees a day or something like that is, is, is the math that I was given. So does it really meaningfully address the agrarian sector? Right. So why don't we then take a step back and look at the, at the, uh, you know, the macro issue, which is that this is something like 75,000 crores being pumped into the economy. Now we can, you know, obviously spend a lot of time discussing about whether it addresses the problem of uh, every individual farmer or any of them or, mm. or, you know, whichever permutation combination thereof. But in aggregate, the fact that you're looking at 75,000 crores being, you know, flowing into, into, uh, into farmers' hands and ultimately finding its way somewhere is the sort of uh, you know uh, is the sort of step which will uh, you know end up uh, pump priming uh, the economy yes that is certainly the hope and i would imagine that uh, once there is a full budget perhaps we will see states also putting forward matching grants and that may then uh, make things a lot better but sangeeta let me come to you now uh, there was a lot of um, talk around ayushman bharat uh, uh, in the budget speech that piyush goel presented uh, you know on balance now we've got about a 100-day-plus experience of the scheme so far. Uh, what would you expect from here on? So clearly, Shireen, uh, we can never undervalue the entire vision of the scheme, which is to bring 50 crore families under coverage. So I continue to commend the scheme. I believe that the first 100 days performance in terms of the number of people who have utilized hospitalization, mm who have come under the cover is also quite significant, which really shows the fact that this was a much needed scheme. Mm. I continue to iterate that, you know, many states have been doing this for the last five to eight years, yeah. and therefore there is a proof of concept in That's it. Right. What I was heartened by today's budget is that the dialogue slightly shifted now. Mm. It was beyond uh, talking about Ayushman Bharat to handle hospitalization, to also focus on health and wellness. Yeah. Now, we've been piloting a conversion of the primary health care uh, centers mm. into wellness centers. Mm. And that, if we do these two in combination with a good IT stack, I believe our health sector is on a positive road. You know, there are steps to be done yeah. in, still for the private sector, uh, you know, to spur increased private sector uh, development of infrastructure in right. tier three cities. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots more work to be done in terms of pricing, in mm. terms of the IT connectivity, in terms of using artificial intelligence, lots yeah. to be done, but I think these three are very strong beginnings. And uh, I think this one step which happened in terms of reduction of the, uh, the standard deduction on yeah. medical reimbursement, so it used to be 40K, it's gone to 50K. 50, yes. I commend the move, but I think, I think the, it was a too little. Uh, and I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Saita. You know, just as far as indirect taxes are concerned, uh, GST shortfall, uh, the indirect tax growth has been 6% versus 23%, which was uh, budgeted. Uh, and, you know, the worry is that are we assuming uh, too much tax buoyancy to be able to deliver on the 3.4% number, given the, the performance? Right. So one has to go down the fine print and understand the detailing clearly, but, but somewhere the math seems to be a little difficult to completely comprehend at first blush. But I, the way I would look at it is, yes, GST has fallen short in the current year probably. Uh, but the way I look at it is that it has kept growing mm. and it's stabilizing. Compliance is also improving. Mm. In this year, they dropped rates quite a bit on GST. Yeah. And I think the indirect tax collection number that you're looking at yeah. is probably not completely reflective of the growth. Mm. So the way I look at it is last year, the GST collections on an average were 85,000 yeah. crore a month. And this year, this it's, about year it's about 90, about 95,000 to, yeah. 95, to a lack. Yeah. of crore one well, per well, month. Well, not accounting for refunds. We don't really have the refund numbers accurately. Yeah, but this is by and large. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's still a growth from 85 to 95 yeah. or whatever, or 12, 13 percent right. growth. I think the thing, probably the detail is in the excise, particularly mm. on petroleum products, mm. Mm. because crude prices have dropped, Drop. they were cut yeah. in the rates because of, because of, you know, various reasons. And therefore, I think a large part of the drop mm in the expected collections on indirect tax may not entirely be because of GST or mm. GST may not even be the main reason, right. but it might be more to do with excise and so on. Okay. So one has to get into the exact details, but I think if that's the numbers at the moment, I would go with uh, 
caution. transparency and trust with the numbers, yeah. but with a bit of caution to say we one has to go into the details. Uh, absolutely. Mr. Bodhi, let me ask you about, you know, the, the effort also to unlock a sector that has been stagnant for the last few years, real estate. It's had a series of problems now and with this announcement coming in on being able to uh, to offset your rental income for a second home and some of the other changes as well, do you believe that the housing sector perhaps could start to see a move up? I think it will take two more steps which were announced. One was announced that their intention to see that GST somehow comes down. Yeah, yeah. which Se will be a matter that will be taken correct. by the GST so council. Yeah. Secondly, again coming back, you will say I am talking of RBI every time. <laughs> Until unless interest rate come down and EMI is reduced to house buyers, whatever government may do, I am not going to buy or the poor man is not going to buy a house. Huh. So what, because the housing sector is suffering from lack of demand. And demand will only come either price goes down hmm. or EMI goes down. Hmm. So government can do is price goes down hmm. and bank has to do EMI come down. Huh. Combination of both, okay. then the we are through. okay. So it comes back to Shakti Kanta Das, and we'll have to see what he delivers uh, uh, in in the next few weeks. But uh, Sandeep, in terms of business confidence now, uh, you know, uh, and the data is literally quite all over the place at this point in time. It's hard to decipher what the data is telling us, but. You know, industry captains like yourselves will have a better sense because your order books will tell you what's happening, your sales will tell you what's really happening on the ground, and we've seen patchy performance. Auto, for instance, has seen a difficult period. Cement sales, on the other hand, are showing double-digit growth. So what are you picking up from the ground in terms of confidence, the ability to spend, the ability to hire, the ability to invest? So I'm optimistic, personally. I think if you look at average capacity utilization across all industry, it's now bumped up to about 74, 75 mm. percent. Mm. When you start getting to 80 percent, industry has to start planning expansion, right. whether green field, brown field, mm. brown field is shorter, green yeah. field takes a long time. I think there are some sector specific issues across some industries, but okay. that's unique to them. Mm. As you said, cement, the consumption is going up, but their cost has gone up, mm. so their PNL is under pressure. Mm. But overall, if you look at uh, industry, I think industry is on a good footing. Okay. Auto was poor in the third quarter mm. uh, of the year. Yeah. Uh, it had a poor Diwali, both uh, four-wheelers as well as two-wheelers. Two wheelers, yes. uh, but I think uh, on the whole, industry will reinvest and start building capacity towards the end of this year. So, so it will still take all of uh, 2019 before we start to see fresh investment? So I think you will start seeing fresh investment post the new government. People will, people have started planning. Okay. But the actual work on the ground will start mm. towards the third quarter of the calendar year. Okay. All right. Uh, Shubhata, let me ask you in terms of all of the other announcements that we saw and more importantly, uh, the vision that was sort of outlined, which if they come back to power, they will take forward. But even if you look at any other political party, I mean, everyone is sort of saying the same things, whether it's a minimum income guarantee or infrastructure spending and so on and so forth. On the back of that, uh, you know, this talk about digitalizing villages, uh, boosting infrastructure growth. What, what, would you, what would be your key takeaways from what you have seen so far? Well, you know, first of all, I think it was a nice touch to sort of lay out the vision for the next 10 years. I mean, you can argue that this was a, a, a very public way of sort of uh, you know, giving a hint speech. at what, your, what yeah. your manifesto is going to be, but what's wrong in that? Yeah. And, uh, but from that point of view, I mean, I think the clarity of vision is w what is more important. I mean, you know, different people can have uh, different takeaways or focus on, on, on different aspects. But to my mind, the clarity of, of, you know, where we are and, you know, where we want to be in 10 years, mm. that was the more important part. Okay. Because too often we get caught up in the, in the short term, uh, yeah. you know, uh, outlook or what did this, this budget, uh, you know, bring about for industry or whatever it is. Yeah. So sort of, you know, addressing the short term but laying out a vision for the long term I thought was a nice touch. Okay. Sangeeta, uh, the key takeaways outside of Ayushman Bharat and the health related announcements for you? <coughs> So for me, the fact that everyone was touched upon, I think, was a good one. I especially appreciate the fact that the unorganized sector and the uh, entire social planning for them, mm. the social security cover, yeah. because I yeah. think that's a segment that's not been looked into enough. That was a good one. I want to reiterate that I believe that this becoming a five trillion economy, five years, this aspirational vision is powerful. And I also think the AI point was important to reiterate mm. because in an IT industry which has hitherto grown
grown on a wage arbitrage, India yeah. does this lower cost. Yeah. To come out front and say that we will do AI, we will do mm. products of the future, mm. that was an important point to come and I think mm. that would propel us into a different level on the IT front. Yes. So social sector, multi-sectorial approach mm. and the AI were the highlights for me. Uh, yes, you had the Kam Denu Yojana and the National Center for Excellence for AI all in the same uh, same budget speech. So, uh, as I pointed out, li quite literally something for everybody. Wrap up comments from each one of you. Sandeep Samani, I'll start by asking you. So, you think that uh, uh, that this has enough now uh, to be able to swing things in the government's favor uh, for the elections? Because let's be clear, th th this this is being positioned as an election budget. Uh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, swinging it in their favor, I don't think 6,000 rupees to the 12 Farmer. crore farmers will do it. It's okay. too little, too little in today's day and age, but it is a help. Mm. Now, whether now it depends on how they market the mm. 6,000 mm. aggressively, yeah. but that by itself will not swing it. Okay. Uh, I mean, but overall, the budget from an interim budget point of view was interesting uh, and they've done uh, and I like socks. the way corporate India has not even asked for anything this time around nobody went in with a wish list uh, <laughs> at all so they had, they had resigned themselves to the thought we that there is going to be no going so to be nothing, nothing, nothing for corporate raised. sector nothing has been raised, raised. yes yeah. Mr. Modi uh, will, will it uh, swing things in the government's favor I think a little bit yes whatever swing needs to be but I think one more issue which I thought I'll raise is gradually budget is losing its relevance <laughs> Because GST is there for huh. indirect taxes, huh. only direct taxes which is stabilized we from... We say this every year, yet every year, PIKI, CII, ASOCHAM and everybody else lines up with, with their long list of... No, because <laughs> it is, it is, <laughs> we are doing your job. <laughs> but really speaking, yeah. because a major issue is government expenditure only. That's true. That's so true. we can analyze that, that's all. Yeah. No, I, 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 I do, I do in agree with you, by the way. Pranav Saita, final uh, comments from you. So I think it's a great interim budget. Actually, it brings in much more than I had expected, I'll be honest. Uh, from the final budget, however, I would feel something more structural might and, and to address infrastructure and job creation a little more directly hmm. would be far better. Okay. Uh, so the way I look at it, for example, agrarian distress, all of our hearts reach out to the farmers. But this 6,000 rupees or whatever per month, per, per year is not going to solve the problem, yeah. as Sandeep yeah. also said. I think there needs to be money put into infrastructure and farm sector reform mm. such mm. that they can be much better off for a longer term period Absolutely. rather than trying to accept, expect SOPs every now and then from the budget. Absolutely. So I think that's the need of the hour, whether infrastructure in the farm sector generally or for industry to revive the capex and the investment cycle is something that I would love to see. Well, gentlemen uh, and Sangeeta, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us here on the budget fine print to decode uh, the interim budget that was presented by Finance Minister Piyush Goyal. For now, from all of us here, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.